Hello there, and welcome to another Polyphonic Q&A. It has been a hot minute since I've done one of these, so this might be a little bumpy. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind you all that the impetus for this Q&A is to celebrate the upcoming release of my book, Century of Song. Century of Song is a history of American pop music as told through 101 different songs. I take one song to represent each year from 1923 to 2023. The songs are meant to show kind of what was going on aesthetically, historically, culturally during those periods. Really, it's like mini polyphonic videos, 101 mini polyphonic videos. If you like my channel, you will like this book. And because I consider my channel's visuals to be almost as important as the information itself, the book also has visuals. Each chapter has a full-page piece of collage art designed by me, so it's a beautiful book as well as a good one, I hope. Okay, with that being said, let's get into the questions. To start off, we've got a couple questions about the book itself, and then from there we'll go into broader questions about all sorts of nonsense. Right off the top, I've had a number of logistical questions about the book. A lot of this stuff is really out of my hands. It has to do with the publisher and the distributor, but I think it should be available in bookstores in most countries where English books are sold. As for other languages, I don't think there's plans of doing it in other languages just yet, but, you know, if it sells well, there might be a market for that. I don't really know how the business side of these things works. I would love for it to be in other languages, but I know that's a another cost for the publisher. So it really depends on how the book does, I suppose. And that's the exact same with the audiobook. Personally, I really, really hope that I can make an audiobook of it at some point. I love audiobooks. I listen to them all the time. And, you know, given the nature of my content, I think it would make a good audiobook. But again, I think that's something for down the line really depends on you know, how the book performs and what the publisher wants. A lot of this stuff, unfortunately, is out of my hands. Max Tofsty Music asks if I sign my books. Yeah, I'm, I, I think I'm going to do a book signing event when it launches in my home city uh, and maybe do signed books elsewhere. I don't really know. I, I guess this is something to ask to you. Would there be, would you guys have interest in signed editions of the books. If I came to your city, would you want me to do a little book signing event and maybe we can watch videos or something? I like the idea. I've always wanted to do some sort of live polyphonic event, so something with a book signing could happen eventually, but I don't really... Yeah, I don't really know the logistics of something like that just yet. Okay, now we've got some questions about the content of the book. Um, we Are Not The Same asks a couple. Uh, what is my favorite year of the music? That's a tough one. There's a couple years that have always stuck out to me as favorites, and these were some of the years that it was a little difficult to pick just one song for. 1959 is sort of the year jazz went crazy with, you know, Ornette Coleman and Dave Brubeck and Miles Davis and Charles Mingus. You know, 59 is a famously good year in jazz. For that one, I picked Lonely Woman by Ornette Coleman because I thought it sort of represented the ethos of experimentation going along there. You know, a lot of the mid-60s years, 67, 68, it's pretty dense in the mid to late 60s. And then I've always loved 1977 as a year of music. In the book, I've got Donna Summer's I Feel Love, but in 77, you also see Fleetwood Mac's Rumors, you see David Bowie's Heroes, you see Exodus by Bob Marley, unreal year of music. You know, if, if you put a gun to my head, 77, I might pick as the best year of music ever. And then more recently, 2004 was a pretty big year as well. What chapter of the book is my favorite and which was the most interesting to write? That's tough. I like a lot of the chapters. My favorite might just be 1965, Like a Rolling Stone, because I've wanted to do something about Like a Rolling Stone for a long time. That's a song that means a lot to me, and it was fun to to get to write that. I'm also quite proud of my chapter on Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, which is obviously a very important song. Which is the most interesting to write? I really had a good time writing 1943, which is Rodgers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma. I've always loved, you know, musicals, but I'd never really gotten into Oklahoma. And in sort of looking at this, I realized Oklahoma is kind of the birth of the modern musical in a lot of ways. And I got I got into a pretty big Oklahoma kick. Uh, my wife can attest to the fact that I was listening to Oh, What a Beautiful Morning and Oklahoma on repeat for like a month. I was just fixating on those. So that was a really fun chapter to write. 
Burgess Sam asks how I conducted my research for the book. By this point, my research process has been pretty streamlined for a while. It's a lot of similar stuff to how I research my videos. And there's no sort of all-encompassing place I go for this stuff. It really sort of depends. For a lot of the more modern stuff, you can read a lot of interviews, you know, there's tons of press tours, you listen to artists talk about their songs a lot. A lot of the more modern stuff, there's just there's just so much more out there on it. So I get a lot more primary sources from that. Whereas for a lot of the older stuff, you know, some of the some of the really older kind of jazz stuff and like Rhapsody in Blue and stuff like that, and some of the folk music, there's more scholarly sources on them. Um, a couple books that I read, papers that I was able to dig into a little. And then from there, it's sort of a lot of piecing together from various online sources, archives of interviews, you know, biographies of bands, documentaries. And a lot of what I do with this is sort of synthesizing information. So, you know, I'll watch a documentary and then I will cross-reference that against a bit of a biography and then, you know, cross-reference that against an interview or something like that. A lot of it is sort of taking disparate sources, checking them, making sure that they all sort of tell a consistent story. And yeah, often they don't, but weeding that out and figuring out what's real and figuring out what is sort of apocryphal is, it's a big part of the process. One of the big things that often happens, um, and I need to give a huge shout out to my research assistant, uh, Matt, for a lot of this, because he's done, he's done a ton of research for me, and he is really, really good at sussing out, like, verifiable sources of stuff, because often what you'll have is you'll have this really good quote, and then you'll have, like, 30 different sites pointing to this quote, but none of them will actually cite the actual origin of the quote, you know, the actual issue of Rolling Stone it was said in, or or the biographer who said it, or something like that. So then you kind of got to hound and use Google Books and stuff like that to really dig in and see if you can find the actual source of the quote. A lot of this stuff is stuff that I learned in my journalism training too. Sam also asked about the structure. Uh, when did that arise in the writing process? Basically right away. So the way that the book came about was my publisher, Page Street Publishing, reached out asking if, you know, I was interested in writing a book for them. And I said, yeah, and threw some ideas around. And then I just sort of, I don't know, this idea sort of came to me. It, it just felt like a neat novel idea. So I sort of honed in on that. And it was all built out from this structure. Originally, it was going to be just any song, but I realized that was too broad. So I sort of narrowed into American music because that's kind of my my specialty. Even though I'm Canadian and not American, the reality is like my love, my passion is American popular music. You know, there's a lot of other musics that I like, but even a lot of the musics that I like are sort of born from the American popular tradition, which is jazz, blues, rock and roll, hip hop. You know, all of these things are kind of quintessentially American musics. America is sort of a cultural giant in terms of music. Staffy Lee Music asked, what are some songs I really wanted to have in the book but needed to get bumped? And Lonkin Park also asked a pretty similar question. Which year was the hardest to choose only one song or which songs would have been immediate shoe-ins if I could choose two rather than one? So a lot of the book actually has honorable mentions where I talk about songs that didn't quite make the cut. Some of the really big ones that I wanted to write on, 1964, I really, really wanted to do it on Mississippi Goddamn. Uh, because I love that song, and Nina Simone is incredible, and I think that that song, you know, provides a sort of different tenor to the civil rights movement and is a very bleak depiction of the racism happening at the time, but I settled on A Change Is Gonna Come, Sam Cooke's civil rights anthem, because A, a it's, a, I guess, a bit more of a positive story, but B, like, A Change Is Gonna Come is one of the most important songs ever recorded. So that's one that I would have really loved. 1971, I would have loved to do Maggot Brain, but I settled on Carole King. And really, actually, there's a couple things in 1971. Also, like Sly and the Family Stone would have been really fantastic to get in there, but I couldn't. Oh, and one that like I really, really wish I could have got in, in was in 1958, I opted for Miles Davis's Milestones over Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good. 
Johnny B. Good honestly probably had the bigger impact, but the 50s was already, you know, pretty heavy on rock and roll. Uh, I already had, you know, big sections on That's All Right, Tutti Frutti, Hound Dog, and into the 60s, you get a lot of rock music. And also just, I think Miles Davis is, you know, maybe the most brilliant musician ever to live. And I think it would have been a huge oversight not to have him in there. Oh, and speaking of brilliant musicians who I didn't get in there, I could not find time. Again, in the 50s, so much happened in the 50s with the explosion of rock and roll. I just could not wedge in Ella Fitzgerald, which is a huge, huge oversight. And I really wish that she could have found a home in there. Yeah, so that's a lot of them. If you buy the book... There's honorable mentions, so you'll see other places where I, you know, might have wanted to slip someone else in. Okay, those are most of the questions I got about the book itself. So I hope that piques your interest a little. And something I wanted to mention is I would love to see your guys' versions of Century of Song. You know, obviously you don't need to write a whole book, but I would love to see your list by the parameters. Uh, the parameters are simple. You pick one song each year. The song doesn't necessarily need to have come out that year. You know, some songs come came out in, like, late 1967 and, you know, were impactful in 1968 or something like that. And there's, there's a few edge cases, too. But broadly, the song needs to have had an impact in that year. And then you only get one song per artist. And another thing I tried to do is also just diversify genre because there's a lot going on. But I would love to see you know, your own iterations of this, even if it's just like 20 years or something, or even if it's maybe maybe from your country or maybe from all music. I don't know. I think this is a really fun activity and I kind of, I invite you to to do it. It's a, it's, it's a bit of a puzzle, that's for sure. All right, let's go to a couple questions from the Polyphonic Discord now. By the way, I have a Discord. You can check it out with the link here, you know, it's a good it's a good vibe. Very chill folks in there. Big fan of them. Bearstronaut asks, are there any YouTubers or Nebulans I want to collaborate with? Any plans for Polyphonic Magazine to return? Do I regret the face reveal? As for the collaborations, honestly, there's a ton. I would love to collaborate with, I don't know, I, I love Jacob Geller's work. I'm currently working on something, collaborating a little with Maggie Mae Fish, which is, she's a creator that I absolutely love. I want to collaborate more, but the realities of collaborating in the creator economy, it's more difficult than it seems because there's no sort of standardization, right? Everyone kind of has their own process and almost all of these processes are also just sort of like flying by the seat of our pants. So it's tough to collaborate. I'd also love to collaborate on a video with Corey from 12 Tone. I obviously collaborate with them on a podcast and, you know, we talk lots and stuff, but I've, we've never actually formally collaborated on a video. I don't think that doesn't seem like something we've done. Uh, remind me if we have, but yeah, that's, those are some of the big ones. Do I regret the face reveal? No, honestly, I, I actually intend to start doing more on camera stuff. The big thing is basically just that, uh, I need to get a whole proper on camera setup going and I want to build a set and stuff like that. So I think maybe in fall or maybe next year, we'll see. I'll, I'll probably be doing more on camera stuff. As for Polyphonic Magazine, I got a couple questions about that. The short answer is, I don't know. The long answer is, I really am proud of Polyphonic Magazine. I'd love to do another season of it. I think it's some of the best work that I've done. I think it's a novel concept, and I think it executed really well. But also, it was like really, really intensive. That whole year between Polyphonic Magazine and Axe to Grind really took a lot out of me. So right now I'm sort of trying to get my feet under me again and work on some other projects. I would love to do another season of Polyphonic Magazine eventually, though. I don't see it happening imminently, but I wouldn't write off the possibility. Adam Baker asked, what's research I did for a video that I found really interesting but didn't end up making the final cut? What's a rabbit hole that I went down in researching a video that I didn't expect but ended up being extremely fruitful? These are really good questions, but the thing is... I don't know if any of you are students or have ever been students. Statistically, a lot of you are students and or have been students. You know, the sort of like post-exam brain dump where you finish exams and just sort of like flush all of the information out of your brain? That tends to be how I function with my videos. 
I steep myself in research, or these days, honestly, my research assistant, Matt, does a lot of my research, but, you know, we steep ourselves in research, and then once the video is out, I kind of just empty my brain and purge this stuff, so nothing comes to mind offhand, unfortunately. I'm sure there's interesting stuff that I'm lear- I've am i learned, but I, I have a hard time pulling it up. Bearstronaut also asked, you know, other projects I've got going and live streams I'm planning on doing, There is a whisper of a rumor on the wind that very important charts may make its grand return sometime in the next couple months. Again, I'm working on getting a live stream set up going, so that's something that is around the corner a little, but I've been really busy with a lot of life stuff. I've been settling into a new house. I got a puppy. Um, Here's Polyphonic Pupper. Her name is Molly. Here's her. It's it's Mollyphonic. Here's a picture of Molly. She's wonderful. Um, She is a border collie St. Bernard, but she is a a bit of a handful, so she's been taking a lot of my energy. Um, But I'm slowly working towards some other stuff. As for other projects I've been working on, yeah, I've always got projects on the go. One big thing I've been doing is I've been making a lot of art, a lot of visual art, uh, physical collage specifically. This is something I want to eventually get a setup going, live streaming myself making this while hanging out with you all because I really enjoy the process of this. And I'm actually sort of slowly working on getting together a store where you can buy these collages, either in prints or originals. All of that is actually available on Etsy. The link to that is up here. Um, I really love making this art. Uh, It's a very zen process for me, so I want to put more out. And so, yeah, if you guys are interested in buying that and supporting me, that's there. I'm thinking of maybe putting some of them on t-shirts or something or stickers. Maybe, I don't know. I'm still, I'm still figuring out sort of what that looks like, but yeah, that's there if you want to buy some stuff. And then I'm part of an artistic collective called Optical Collusion. Uh, We've had some film screen and kind of local documentary festivals and stuff like that. We're sort of slowly working toward formalizing a place where we can you can see all of this stuff so keep an eye out for that and then on top of that two more projects one i am currently querying and chopping around a fiction book uh i i love writing fiction eventually i just i want to be a novelist this is a young adult fiction book about uh, a kid who discovers his grandfather's record collection and learns that his sort of hippie metalhead grandfather was actually a sorcerer using or like Black Sabbath records to cast magic. And then he kind of needs to learn this magic to fight off demons that are haunting his family and threatening to tear them apart. It's a fun little project. I'm hoping maybe this time next year I'll be doing a Q&A about that book. I've written fiction all my life. It's maybe the thing that I enjoy the most in life right now, ma- writing fiction and making art. So there's going to be more of that. And one more project. <laughs> um, oh God, I do a lot. I am slowly working on developing a um, D&D adventure or a TTRPG adventure. Uh, right now I'm designing it in 5th edition. I think eventually I might try to release it as sort of a system agnostic thing. It's a Feywild adventure. Very dark, very whimsical, hopefully interesting. I'm, I'm really just designing it for me and my friends, but you know, if anyone would be interested in that, I do a lot of TTRPG design. I've, I've designed like a couple. I have various like city maps and battle maps and stuff like that. I've considered releasing them somewhere, but again, who has the time? So yeah, that's that's a lot of what I've been up to. Novia asks any music I've been particularly into lately. I fixated hard on uh, The Hazards of Love by Decemberists for a while. I think a commenter of mine actually suggested it or someone on Twitter suggested it at some point. But yeah, I, I've been getting into that album a lot. I think it's really good. I really liked the new Cindy Lee album. That was that was a, a huge vibe. Oh, and I loved the new Billie Eilish. I recorded an episode of Ghost Notes talking about that. That should be coming out. I don't know. I don't know when Ghost Notes comes out. I just talk to Corey and then podcasts come out. So it comes out on Nebula first. I know that. As I've been sort of getting back into the swing of making videos, you know, typically the music that I'm really into is the videos that I'm working on. Uh, So I have been listening to The Who's Tommy a lot. 
um, that's a little uh, sneak peek of something to come, I suppose. The Muffin asked, what's the best advice I have to offer for someone looking into editing videos? So there's a couple levels of advice here. The first level of advice is the advice that you give to anybody looking into any creative pursuit ever, which is just do it. Just start doing it. Open a video editor and play around. I use Adobe's Creative Suite. I recognize that there's a uh, barrier to entry there because of price. So I don't think you need to use Adobe Suite. It's just what I use. I like it. I'm familiar with it. Find a video editor and just start playing around. Uh, that's the first thing. The only way you're going to get better is by doing. Don't wait for something to be perfect. Finish videos and move on to the next one with the lessons you've learned from that one. My early videos are really rough compared to the stuff I do now. Some of those have literal millions of views, and in my mind, they look like garbage. But now I'm able to, with relative ease, make stuff that I think is, you know, pretty good and looks pretty cool. So just rather than getting bogged down and trying to make one thing perfect, you're way better off just you know, trucking through and pushing on to the next one and the next one and the next one. And that's how you overcome the taste gap. Listen to Ira Glass's thing on the taste gap. That's some of the best advice ever for any creative field. And then some more practical stuff. Uh, Pexels, great free image library. Wikipedia Commons, the Smithsonian, Raw Pixel all have public domain asset collections, which are Really, really useful. Wikipedia Commons is what I usually use. It's a little tough to navigate, but once you figure it out, it can be really good. And then if you are using Adobe After Effects, uh, get the plugin Flow. That is the best advice I can give. Uh, Flow and Handycam are the two best plugins, but Flow especially just makes keyframing way easier and will absolutely change your life. So I hope that's enough good advice. Oh, one more piece of advice. If you want to edit videos, start watching videos with the mind of an editor. Ask why people are doing certain cuts. Ask how they're making the videos. When you see a visual that you like, try to deconstruct it in your head. Be like, what does the timeline for this look like? You know, start watching with an editor's eye and, you know, you're training your brain to figure this stuff out and work backwards. A lot of effects that I do and a lot of things I've done, I've just done by reverse engineering things that I like. And, you know, often the process is I see an effect that I like, I try to reverse engineer it, I fail, but I end up failing in an interesting way and that becomes my style. Goon you good thing. Oh, I feel gross saying that name. Asks a really interesting question, basically about the disappearance of folk musics and local scenes that comes with the rise of the internet. And this is honestly something that I think about a lot. I talk a lot about the disappearance of folk music. A lot of folk musics just, especially in the West, just like don't exist anymore or have been cornered and marginalized. And I think there's something really sad about that but I also think it's a something lost something gained situation music changes culture changes cultural practice always changes it changes with technology it changes with time it evolves these things happen so I don't think it's an enormous tragedy but I do think there is something lost with the loss of folk scenes and also with the loss of not even necessarily folk music but local scenes you know, grunge grew out of a scene of a bunch of people all playing in similar bands, going to similar venues, knowing each other. Same with, you know, the New York jazz scene, Miles Davis and John Coltrane, and all these people were hanging out at the same parties, talking to each other, and that kind of creates this electric nucleus of energy that just sort of explodes into brilliant creativity. I've wanted to do a video on the death of the local scene for a while. I've ranted on this a little bit. There are still some local scenes Notably Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta's local scene still goes really strong. Um, New Orleans also still has a rich, rich kind of history with its own scene there. But yeah, there is something lost in this. Um, and I don't think it needs to be lost. I like I think I think we can kind of have it both ways, but what what we need is we need more people to go out and support their local scenes. You know, rather than pay $500 to Ticketmaster to, to see an artist who has been around forever and is just doing nostalgia stuff, go to your local venues, support your local scenes. And if you're a musician, 
I mean, if you're a musician in a local scene, you know, you're already in the scene. You know these people. Um, a lot of it has to come from us buying buying records from local musicians. Fans make scenes happen, and I think a lot of the erosion has come from less and less people supporting local. So save yourself some money and have a great time and go to more local shows. I'm I'm begging you. Like We all know how much Live Nation sucks. What they don't have is control of your local scene. Ask a punk, you know? Go to local shows, and you yourself can be part of breathing life back into local scenes. Noah Reese Clausen uh, asks about Joni Mitchell. Yeah, I don't know. What makes her special to me? I mean, obviously she has the voice of an absolute angel. She has this ethereal quality. Um, but I think, for me, the brilliance of Joni is her ability to sing nuanced emotions and you know she she does melancholy so well and her words are so carefully placed and she's a melodic genius i think also it's a testament to her as a person how she was able to thrive in a lot of scenes that were frankly quite misogynistic it feels like she's sort of dancing circles around uh, a lot of the men in the scenes that she ran in. I think those scenes made her a little cold and cynical, uh, but I think they they would have done that to anyone. I think her early work is just some of the best, you know, singer-songwriter stuff ever written. But then also she has, when she gets into the jazz stuff, she has such an ear for lush sound palettes. I mean, the vocal breakdown on Car on a Hill or even just like everything about Help Me, some of the best sounding music ever. Ubik459 asked about, this was on the video uh, of Bessie Smith, about Smith's voice coming through loud and clear, and says they don't feel a lot of modern recordings do this. I'm not a sound engineer, but the realities of this stuff is very complex. It just really depends how stuff is mic'd. You know, a lot of older music, you listen to Frank Sinatra or stuff like that, this was made by high production value, high budget studios who were using state-of-the-art equipment. As equipment has become more and more mass-produced, it's become a lot easier for, you know, your average Joe to go into their bedroom grab a mic and just sort of sing through it. It's easier than ever for that to sound decent, but also like sound engineers are incredibly talented people that have developed a very specific skill set over years of practice. So yeah, when there's less people using professional sound engineers, a lot of stuff is going to sound not quite as good. You know, no matter how good the technology is, a proper engineer, a proper mic tech, that's going to make a world of difference. Some more Discord questions. What's my favorite tree? Cedars, probably. I like cedar trees a lot. If you're asking specific tree, at my family cottage, there's this kind of cedar grove that it's like four cedars all growing together from the same root, and it's great to go climb and sit in. So big fan of cedar trees. I also like a good mangrove. I find mangroves very cool and interesting, and I like baobab trees a lot. Um, baobabs are pretty pretty neat looking trees. And I've never seen one in real life, but I would love to see California redwoods. I'm a big tree guy, uh, so that's a good question. Favorite flavor of tea? Harney and Sons Hot Cinnamon Sunset. Just absolutely cannot be beat. Especially good served with honey and a splash of bourbon. Mm. The Muffin asks if they can get me some coffee. Uh, I don't drink coffee, but you can get me some tea. Um, and if you want to give me some money for tea or coffee, you can tip me at my coffee. I don't know if that was an intentional setup, but thank you, Muffin. Y'all can tip me at coffee.com slash polyphonic if, if you want to give me a tip. I don't know. It's nice to get a buck or two sometimes. What's my favorite and least favorite part of making content for YouTube slash Nebula? My favorite part is editing visuals. Uh, I like making pretty things. I like the creative process. My least favorite part is dealing with algorithms and dealing with content. All of the stuff that you need to do in order to edit the videos. My dream would be to just edit videos and shout them into the void and have money come back my way. Uh, but, you know, you gotta play the game. And I hate playing the game. Oh, and my other least favorite part is disputing copyright claims. Fuck that. Monster Hunter Bilald asks if I often listen to live albums or live recordings 
or bootlegged stuff. I used to. Um, when I was in high school and university, I got really, really into Zeppelin bootlegs. I um, found like an 11 gigabyte file of Zeppelin bootlegs and used to listen to those live shows a lot. These days, I struggle to listen to a lot of live albums. Um, I think I've become a bit more picky and discerning in audio quality, especially because poor audio quality these days really makes my tinnitus act up. So a lot of live stuff, and especially bootleg, sounds very kind of like blown out, and I don't like that. But there are some live recordings I listen to. I love listening to uh, a lot of Dylan's bootleg series live stuff. I mean... The, the one that takes selections from the Rolling Thunder Review Tour, one of my favorite live albums ever. Apparently, the tour itself was kind of a bit of a mishmash, but they've selected some of the best recordings from that, which really helps. And I guess this sort of counts as live. I love, like, Tiny Desk and Audio Tree Live and those sort of, like, those sort of things. Shaky Graves Audio Tree Live is, I don't know, some of the best videos on YouTube. Um, Absolutely love those. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. And one more question. This is again from Bearstronaut. They ask good questions. This is something that I think a lot of people probably want to know. Am I planning on producing content at a more regular pace again? Yeah, kind of. If I'm going to be perfectly honest, a lot of it is not because I'm feeling the passion for Polyphonic, but because, you know, it's my job. But I'm, I'm feeling less burnt out on it now. Really, I'm sort of taking things day by day and week by week. Uh, I've got some video ideas that I'm excited about. I'm sort of going to experiment with doing a lot more looser, I guess, lower effort content. I'm going to be working on other projects too, like I talked about earlier. But for the next couple of weeks, at least, uh, I'll be doing polyphonic stuff. And then in the fall, I will definitely be doing a lot of stuff. This fall, I've got I've got some ideas I can't promise anything yet, but I've got an idea for another series that's sort of like a, a successor to Axe to Grind um, for this fall that I think could be pretty cool if I could pull it off. No promises, though. Okay, well, that is a lot of questions answered. My head is spinning and my throat is shot, so thank you all so much for your support. Please check out Century of Song. I'm really proud of this. I think it's some of the best work I've done, and I think you would love it. All right. See ya.